This reflection has a title, Listen to the Children. In the passage we listened to earlier, Jesus speaks of the comparisons people were making between his style of engaged living and preaching with that of John the Baptizer. The aesthetic John, wrapped in sackcloth in the wilderness, living on locusts and wild honey. And Jesus, restocking the wine cellars at the local community feasting. Look at this man, the passage says. He's a glutton and a drinker, a friend of tax collectors and outcasts. Jesus, always ready with a memorable image, compares the groups, those for John, those for Jesus, with children calling out in the marketplace, squabbling with each other. No, he says, you're both wrong. It's not about John, not about me. It's about the revelation of God that I bring. It's about the partnership we need to bring to the kingdom. The child image conjured here is familiar to us all. Playground disputes, best friends cold-shouldered for some trivial tiff, sibling rivalry that escalates into pitch battle. All parents, all teachers would recognise the picture. I want this morning, though, to emphasise the positive in childhood and children, their perceptive honesty, their youthful enthusiasm, their willingness to explore, experiment and dream, their unbounded embrace of good causes and their innate understanding of what is right and fair. I'll be calling this morning on 38 years' experience as a teacher, 40 years of parenthood to two sons, and eight years and counting as Papa and Grandpa to Sophia, Eliza and River. Teaching first. The story is told of an inspector visiting a primary school. He found the children busy drawing. What are you drawing? he asked one young lad. I'm drawing God, he replied. But no one knows what God looks like, said the inspector. No, but they will when I'm finished, said the lad. I'm making no claims like that. But working with young people for so long does provide insights that have accumulated over the years. Forty-seven years later, I can still remember an early lesson I taught as a probationer teacher in my first school, Powys Academy. To say that Powys was challenging in the early 70s is an understatement. There was a joke going round in the staff room at the time, situations vacant column of the P&J wanted rear gunner for the Powys milk float. Well, it wasn't that bad. My early lesson to a class described as a bit on the lively side seemed to go well initially. Introduction delivered, I waited. From deep at the back of the class, this cry in broad Aberdeen. Mark me. Roughly translated, this meant, I did so enjoy your preamble to the lesson, Mr Chin, perhaps you could encourage me to the next stage. That pupil taught me a lot. I was a product of a selective senior secondary, Grey School of Art, with teaching practices in leafy Bankery, sleepy Stromness and Aberdeen Grammar, for boys only at that stage. 
I was on a steep learning curve. I had to learn quickly not to lecture from on high, but to get a deeper understanding of what made young folk tick, to get alongside them, to support, encourage, engage, empathise and listen in the exciting journey of creating with them something personal and new. When I left Powys three years later for my first promoted post, I'd learned a lot and was genuinely sorry to go. Caroline and I have been breast with three grandchildren, Sophia, Eliza and River. River, aged four, still laughs uproariously at my terrible jokes. The girls, though, at eight and five, are already fully paid-up members of the sisterhood. They keep me right, let me know that I mustn't wear the same jumper on consecutive days when I visit, and, in no uncertain terms, advise me that double denim is not a good look. Who knew? It was okay in the 60s, girls. Let's eavesdrop into a conversation that I had with Eliza when she was around four and a half. Are you very old? Well, I don't feel old, but I suppose I'm getting on a bit. You're old. You're going to die, you know. I wish you hadn't told me. Don't be silly, Papa. Everybody dies. First you, then Granny, then... Hey, wait a minute. Granny's four months older than me. A rapid recalculation, and we left it at that. Her comment struck home, though. In my allotted time, what example should I be setting, young folk? How closely have I been listening and responding to the messages they are shouting to the world day by day? I'm a recent convert to the smartphone. Until last year, I used what was probably the world's oldest working Nokia 3330. Even ten years ago, it caused uncontrollable laughter if any class I was teaching caught sight of it. Oh, Mr Chin, it's a brick! No longer. I revel now in the delights of Facebook. And it was there, a few weeks ago, before the shocking images of murderous police brutality in America, that I saw this posting that has achieved worldwide attention. Two young boys, around three perhaps, are walking towards each other on the pavement. They spot each other, delight registers. They rush forward and hug, the joy clear to see. Why the multiple likes? Why all the thousand upon thousands of shares? Because one child is black, the other is white. How wonderful that so many people have witnessed a joy. There is my friend, I must hug him. But how sad that this is even worthy of note, the most natural of human actions, compromised by the society that we have built through years of oppression and years of looking the other way. The young can teach us a lot. A few months ago, young people stayed away from school demonstrating against the woeful neglect by governments throughout the world to climate change, pollution and reliance on fossil fuels. They should be in school, 
was the government response. Education is really important. And so it is. The message of Greta Thunberg and tens of thousands of young people like her is one that is really important too. We will have stolen their future if we don't act. Don't call a halt to climate change dangers, to sickening pollution. Don't think about how we want things to be after lockdown ends. The status quo is not an option. The current pandemic has almost certainly been caused by man's destruction of the planet. The never-ending push for profit that causes companies to shrink the boundaries that used to cushion us from virus leaps from animal to human by destroying the rainforests, an example. The prevalence of devastating fires in Australia, the increase in flooding, all linked to exploitation, profit and greed. We can't pretend that our generation can leave to the young all the protesting. This really must be a partnership. Inspirational figures like Sir David Attenborough show that a lifetime dedicated to the planet and its inhabitants can successfully bridge the generational gap and motivate the young. Our post-lockdown thinking needs to focus on all these areas. Government action and personal bridge building to prove that all lives matter. A focus on the environment and climate change. A realisation that the abomination of nuclear arms provide no protection. The enemy will be viral and digital. We can and must continue to witness to a better alternative. Children calling in the street. We want to preserve a society when children are still free to call in the street. To call out against the exploitation of people and the planet, to call a halt to racism, to call a halt to poverty, to call a halt to the arms race, to call for dialogue, understanding and a better way in a post-lockdown world. Jesus had a special place for children in establishing his kingdom. Listen to them. Listen to him. Amen.